Hello and welcome to episode two of what makes this camera lens great. I'm going to take a look at one of the most iconic camera lenses ever made, the Lights Elmer 5cm f3.5. My copy of this little collapsible lens was made in 1937 and it was designed for the famous and hugely influential Leica 1 35mm film camera. If you've ever wondered, as I did before buying the lens, what it's like to use the lens on today's digital cameras, how it performs, and why the Leica cameras it came on are so legendary, then this video is for you. Before talking about the lens, a quick word about the camera I have here. Leica's 35mm film cameras date back to 1913. My camera was made in 1938, eight years after the introduction of the Leica 1 with interchangeable screw mount lenses. Leica cameras introduced the advantages of 35mm film to the general public in a very compact, portable body. Even by the 1930s, film cameras for serious enthusiasts, as opposed to simple box cameras, were still based on larger format film used in folding bellows and reflex cameras. The use of 35mm film really was a big innovation in a little package. Until you hold one of these cameras, you probably won't realise just how compact it is. It's an absolutely exquisite piece of equipment. My camera retains the features of the earliest Leica 1. It wasn't perfect by any means. It had a very simple viewfinder, and the procedure for loading film was fiddly to say the least. The viewfinder was replaced by Leica's famous rangefinder camera, the Leica II, in 1932, but the company continued to make the standard, non-rangefinder version, for a while after that. The first Leica cameras had a fixed lens, but this was replaced with the interchangeable Elmar lens with an L39 screw mount. There are lots of details about early Leica cameras and lenses online and in print, including this enormous and beautifully produced book, so I'll not go into great detail about the history, except to say that Oscar Barnack, who led the design of the early Leica cameras, was determined to make a compact camera, and part of that design philosophy involved a collapsible lens. With such a relatively small film size, it was critical to have a top-performing lens for the camera, a lens that produced high-resolution negatives, so that good quality prints could be made and enlarged from the small negatives. The lens that delivered this quality was designed by Max Berwick. The Elmar name is a combination of Ernst Leitz, the company's owner, and Max Berwick. Over 36,000 of these versions of the L39 Elmer were made between 1930 and the 1950s, with some variations in the numbering and the metals used in the construction. The lens itself has five elements in three groups and ten aperture blades. The minimum focus distance on the camera was one meter. The lens has a tiny ring at the front for opening and closing the aperture. It helps to have good fingernails to move it around. The lens needs a good hood, and there's no screw thread for the hood. Instead, a hood fits over the whole of the front. In terms of adapting the lens for use on digital cameras, I've tried two different ways. The first was to buy an L39 adapter for my camera. I have one here. It's for a Sony E-mount camera. The adapter works fine for fixed L39 lenses, but there are problems with the collapsible lens. The lights will focus to infinity using its adapter, and the lens locks into its full extension. But if you decide to collapse the lens, it's in danger of hitting the camera's sensor. It's not at all good. You can get around this by attaching a small extension tube to the adapter, and you'll still have infinity focus, just. A second way to adapt the lens is to use an L39 to M42 ring and then use an M42 adapter for your camera. This is also for my Sony E-mount. The advantage of this setup with the longer adapter barrel is you can collapse the lens far into the adapter for infinity shots and also extend the lens far out for close-up shots. With this arrangement, I can focus as close as around 16 centimeters from the front of the lens. And by focus, I mean carefully moving the barrel of the lens forwards and backwards. I don't use the focus knob. And now onto how the lens performs optically, starting with its stop down a little to f6.3 or f9. Those are the name stops, unlike the more modern stops of f5.6 and f8, for instance. As a walk-around lens, I found the lens performs well, as long as it's presented with compositions that play to its strengths. At 97 years old, with uncoated glass, it's certainly a challenge, and a curmudgeonly old thing if crossed. Stop down, the lens is sharp at the centre. 
My copy loses its sharpness near the outer borders of a full-frame shot, and it's slightly decentered. but the sharpness in the centre third of the frame is excellent. Shooting scenes with the sun behind me, the lens produced quite nice contrasts and colours, good for a lens designed in the black and white film era. Not so impressive are the contrasts and colours when you're shooting into bright light, and that's not surprising, because the glass isn't coated. You'll quickly see why a hood is essential in bright light, and why even a hood is not enough in some situations. This is a shot taken without a hood, and this is one with a hood. In fact, not just a hood, but also my hand over the hood to give extra protection from the glare. If you have issues with colours and contrasts, then you can simply convert your images to monochrome, and the results can be beautiful. This is one of my favourite shots from the lens. It's of a street in Cambridge. It captures the oldie-worldie atmosphere and texture of the place very well. And here's a selection of some other monochrome images. The lens will also deliver classic-looking street candids of people. I haven't got many of my own to show you, but online, Steve Huff has posted some great examples. Turning to close-up shots, I've had a lot of fun using the lens wide open. As I mentioned, it'll focus as close as 16 centimeters on my adapter, a big improvement on the 1 meter MFD with the original film camera. One of the reasons to take close-up wide open shots with most lenses is to produce bubbles or bouquet balls from out-of-focus highlights, and this lens certainly produces bubbles and balls. Sadly, my copy produces some rather badly defined and messy bubbles, and a few of the larger ones are rather hairy. Apart from that downside, the lens is impressively centre sharp wide open closer up, and it's great that you can focus close up with the adapter on digital cameras. Some people seem to get turned off by the idea of using a 50mm lens that is as slow as f3.5, but they shouldn't be. This slow 50 performs very well wide open. The in-focus parts of images can be beautifully rendered. And leaving aside the blown highlights, I particularly like the rendering of these flowers. Out of focus areas, well, how smooth they are depends on the scene you're photographing. The way the lens has rendered this reasonably busy background is rather lovely, I think. Even busier scenes, of course, produce busier bouquet, but it's not unattractive if you ignore the hairy balls my copy produces. Here are some other shots to take a look at. Snap close up and wide open. If you stop down a little, then the lens becomes bitingly sharp, at least for a film era lens, as I can demonstrate with this handheld image, starting with a straight out of camera full frame shot. Now I'll zoom right into the flower and stalk. I don't know what you think, but I think this is a very impressive result from a lens made in 1937. And to conclude, a few final examples of stop down sharpness and blur. So that's my short, sharp review of this great old lens. I wasn't sure what to expect when I bought the lens and adapted it to work on my digital cameras. I'm a bit of an inverted snob when it comes to Leica, believing my photographic skills, such as they are, will trump whatever magical effects Leica lenses can produce on their own. And by trump, I mean both the good and the bad. However, the Elmer turned out to be an inspirational lens to use. You really do feel you need to try your very best with such an iconic piece of history. I'm not going to use it regularly, and quite frankly, I own less ancient lenses that perform better to my eyes and tastes, but I'll definitely take the lens out occasionally when I need a different kind of lens to keep my photographic juices flowing. The lens and camera weren't hugely expensive to buy compared to most other Leica gear, and I sure am a proud owner. I hope this comes across in the video. Please comment if you feel like it, and until the next time, all the best.